morning we'll have some other folks join in i'm sure as as we go so uh Again, good morning. We'll call the January 27th uh, Town of Sydney Emergency Planning Committee uh, meeting to order. Um, to begin, we'd like to respectfully acknowledge that this morning's meeting is being held on the traditional territory of the Wasanix First Nations. And uh, to kick off a new year, I would like to uh, welcome our new council liaison, uh, Councillor O'Keefe, and her alternate for 2021 will be uh, Councillor Fallot. So welcome aboard and we look forward to working with you uh, this year. So thank you for joining us. Uh, can we have a motion to adopt today's agenda? It's, it's so difficult to go through uh, Robert's rules uh, on via Zoom here. So I'll, I'll, I'll let Donna kind of do some creative uh, first and seconding here, but I'm, I'm sure we can. I'll Work I'll move that process. So thank you. I, I do appreciate that. Um, <laughs> Did anyone then, second it then? <laughs> I'll second. Thank you, Allison. <laughs> I, I think through Zoom it's someone implied, Donna, but we can, <laughs> we can go through there. So and then um, if there's not any errors or omissions, uh, motion to adopt um, the December 16th uh, committee uh, meeting minutes. Are there any issues with those? We have a motion to adopt those. Seconding, all good. Someone's raising their hand. That's marvelous. Great. So we'll we'll move ahead, and uh, we'll just jump to old business. And we'll just go quickly through there. Um, very very happy to uh, to state that um, our extended care, which is our nursing homes and assisted uh, assisted living facilities, um, have been vaccinated, probably up to or exceeding. Uh, 95 percent, which obviously uh, is a major milestone for for the town of Sydney. Um, they're by far our most at risk, uh, you know, cohort of uh, of residents because obviously, uh, obviously because of their advanced age and because they're in nursing homes, they have you know comorbidities that put them at a much greater risk to um, have issues if they were uh, if they were to contract COVID. So that's a, that's a serious concern. So that is very very positive. Um, and I'll ask uh, Deputy Harmon, perhaps, because he's been in, in regular contact with all these facilities, just to perhaps expand on where we are. And the only uh, other outstanding issue is um, there are some facilities, uh, such as the Shoal Center, where assisted and independent living um, share a building. So I'll ask him just to expand if we have any kind of um, details on when perhaps those independent living facilities that share uh, space with, you know, assisted living um, are going to be vaccinated. So, Deputy Harmon, can you expand on that? Okay, thanks, Chief. Uh, yeah, some of the independent folks have been vaccinated when uh, they were there to uh, vaccinate the assisted. Uh, some had extra vaccines on the day they were there, so they were able to uh, provide some with the shot. Um, as for the rest of the people, we're still waiting on VHON. It's likely they'll probably get rolled out in the uh, the phase of their age and that's when they'll come and do it. So uh, regular contact weekly on Mondays with uh, with all the senior homes. And uh, it sounds like uh, the Shoal Center is really pushing to get their folks uh, looked after as soon as possible. I know Shoal is interested in being a kind of a community point for uh, vaccines. So if we could get behind there, they're happy to open their doors and get safety protocols in place and, and vaccine vaccinate people so but yeah as far as the uh, assisted living and nursing homes were like I said the chief said we're north of 95 percent so I think VHA was out here today to hopefully get the last of uh, our folks out here yeah so thank, thanks man. that is just I know that I uh, I sleep much better at night knowing that that uh, that's been done when this all started you know a, a year ago um, I was, you know, even when we just initiated an EOC at a level one, just, you know, myself and Donna and Randy and Mike, um, you know, I was speaking with my, my colleagues in the North Shore Emergency Management Office where it was, this all kind of started um, in North Vancouver uh, at, you know, and the first outbreak was in uh, an extended care facility there in North Van. So really got an understanding of, how much that could, you know, devastate a, you know, it's a larger community than ours, but um, the amount of extended nursing uh, 
homes and, and, and staff capacity they have there basically mimics what Sydney has, even though we're a much smaller um, depart, you know, kind of area to look after. So the fact that we managed to kind of get through this without any um, outbreaks or issues in any of our many extended care facilities is, I think it, it says a lot about the, the folks working there um, and a lot about there's been very diligent and a lot of kudos to Deputy Harmon and to Donna could be in constant contact and support them for over a year and, and probably a little bit of luck as well. So we kind of dodged a bullet or hopefully as long as the vaccine works, uh, we've, we've kind of got past that. So I'm, like I say, I sleep a bit better at night knowing that's we, we've got over that little hump there. Um, we'll transition now to just uh, our mass notification provider. Uh, we are transitioning away from our uh, ERMS, which was our uh, previous provider, uh, based on cost and, and service and a bunch of uh, requirements. We're on a, a short-term bridge contract with them until the end of March, correct me if I'm not uh, wrong, Don, and then we'll be transitioning over to Connect Rocket, uh, which is a more uh, a local provider, uh, perhaps a lot more customer-oriented and as well will uh, result in less cost to the three municipalities because we're doing it collaboratively as, as, a, as a PMO initiative. So Donna, if you could just kind of jump in there and provide a brief update on that on the transition. Yeah, so a lot of it right now is still kind of working behind the scenes. We're just um, completing the content for the new website because it's a different platform, of course. So making sure all the logos are correct, the wording, the buttons and so forth. And then also a big component is um, mapping. The old site was divided into the three municipalities. It drove you to a site specifically to Sydney or specific to North Saanich and Central Saanich where this new site will be one collective site. So it's just really compiling that as a map of the entire peninsula. Um, and then ironing out our communication strategy as well. I've been working with Paula, she's been very helpful. But um, lots going on behind the scenes. As, as Chief said, sometime in March, we'll hope to go live, but um, we're on track so far. So it's progressing well. Excellent, thank you, Donna. That's, uh, that's good news. And just going through the other um, old business, there's no news yet on our UBCM grant. Um, we expect that sometime in February. Um, EOC level one, we continue to meet uh, weekly um, and you know follow up uh, basically in respect to case counts, trends, vaccination status, and uh, different policy implications throughout the CRD in respect to local government and uh, how we deal with staffing and internal business continuity so that that continues and i'll ask mr humble to jump in yeah uh, no i just wanted to uh confirm um uh chief maybe with uh, either you or, or donna do we actually have a an eoc meeting today i saw a cancellation notice go out so i i anticipate uh because we're having this we're not having an eoc is that correct that's correct we we did update the schedule and on uh yeah. they, where they all over we will kind of use this as as that forum as well so gotcha. okay makes sense thanks excellent um anything from the group in respect to just eoc activations or any concerns now that randy's highlighted that this is a, a two for one meeting so i i think we'll probably go over the vast majority of that so go ahead yeah thanks uh i just i wasn't sure i'd bring this up during the round table but uh, i'll bring it up now uh for talking about the eoc stuff but i just wanted to i know there's a bit of a discussion today at the or sorry this week at senior team um with respect to uh um what other jurisdictions are doing and and what we're doing in terms of our municipal hall uh whether or not uh we're open to the public are we accepting appointments etc and uh, and i did confirm with a number of um, CAOs throughout the region that indeed uh, their, their, their town halls, their municipal halls are um, open to the public by appointment only and uh, primarily. So it's by appointment, but uh, they do, uh, they do, see, they do um, provide service to the public within their municipal hall facilities. Again, predominantly by appointment only. Uh, some of them take walk-up traffic as well, um, the one-offs kind of thing. Um, so I just wanted to confirm that with the group that uh, um, it's my understanding that uh, that's um, that's what we should be fundamentally be doing is uh, um, uh, allowing people to uh, transact business within the municipal hall through appointments or um, as well, um, you know, where feasible accepting the uh, the uh, the walk up traffic, 
based upon our uh, allowance of, of numbers within the uh, within the foyer area, et cetera. So uh, just wanted to uh, to clarify that and uh, and uh, make it clear to the group. If we need to change any fun is any of our signage outside or if there's any policies that uh, need to be clarified, you know, we should we should look at that. But uh, uh, to make that clear, but uh, I just wanted to uh, to make it clear to the to the group as well. Thanks. That's Rocky. Uh, thank you. So so Randy, is that something that will be put put in place uh, right away then, or um, does it need to have some further consideration or? It is in place, Councillor O'Keefe. So oh, as far as I'm concerned, it is in place. I just wanted to, it was just a bit of a question mark that, okay. uh, that the group had and and um, and we had a bit of a discussion on it. So I just wanted to to clarify or make that confirmation. Okay, so- As far as I'm concerned, the, uh, the, um, the protocols in terms of how we're handling the public um, is already in place. So, okay. and, and quite frankly, that's fundamentally what we've been doing anyway, so. Okay. So yeah. I, yeah, I didn't know the bit about that we were accommodating uh, walk up people. So that's, yeah, thanks yeah. for that. You betcha. Yeah, I'll, I'll check the signs out front and just take a look at those and see if they do reflect that or if we need to change the messaging there. Thanks, Elsie. Yeah, and these are, these are all great points and I'd just echo. I mean, we're still in the, we're in the business of obviously providing service, whether it's development services or the, the fire department or inspections or first responder calls at, you know, three in the morning, it's this through the lens of different and heightened, uh, you know, protective, you know, protocols in place. And that's really what the big change is now. And I think that's, we just have to look at that is, you know, the days of we still want to make sure that we as a department in, in, in internally in fire, we're going and we're conducting, you know, uh, inspections and premises to make sure they're safe. And we want to make sure that people uh, smoke detectors are still there um, and working and we change them and we, we work on those but um, instead of going and doing that on a you know a kind of a, a basis where someone would call and we would send someone out there now there's a you know a bit of a process we ask a lot of questions kind of go through a COVID screening um, obviously if they, there's any questions or answers that don't kind of fit the um, you know the algorithm to kind of rule out that there's a risk we'll we'll put it off and if not um we'll go into someone's home but uh obviously gloves masks all those things just to make sure that uh, we're protected the individual's protected but also still that you know they're going to have a functioning smoke detector so it's just a, a whole lot of heightened process just to continue to deliver service i think is this the way where we have to conduct business at least for let's hope the summer only so um any other new business from the group before i have a couple of points concerns um yes councillor keep uh thanks i i had a couple things just well just because i had uh, the chamber meeting at nine o'clock right before this and there's a couple of things but um in terms of your meeting procedure i don't know if that's like a round table thing or where i would where's the appropriate place to Sure, we, we do, uh, we have a new business um, and then we do have a round table uh, at the end, but under new business, I'm sure this is an appropriate time. So please go ahead. Okay, so as I mentioned, so as I'm the liaison to the chamber, so I just finished up a meeting with them. And so a couple of things that they brought up um, and I, I think it's relevant to this committee, but you can tell me if it's not. Um, but as some of you may know, they had quite a, a traumatic uh, incident uh, a little while ago involving homeless people where um, the the front of the building, uh, Denny Warner, the executive director showed up one morning and it was covered with a white powder. And um, anyways, it involved, uh, they had to call the, the hazmat team. Um, one thing she mentioned about the, the, has, the CRD hazmat, they were disappointed that the CRD hazmat showed up with these two great big trucks to uh, that and they were hoping that they would be able to analyze what this was but they don't have that testing uh, capability so she had to go through quite an onerous and traumatic process it sounds like 
uh, with hazmat suits, stripping down completely, going through a decontamination process in the freezing cold. So it, it sounds like it was pretty, um, as I say, pretty traumatizing. And they had to uh, wait for a truck to come from the mainland to, to, to determine whether this was a hazardous su substance. In the end, it just turned out to be baby powder. But um, I guess what her question was, was um, what's the route to uh, sort of provide feedback to the CRD on our, our, our ability to respond to and test for hazmat issues with that? So I don't know if that was just sort of a normal course of how things take place in terms of hazmat stuff or whether there was an unusual circumstance that day that required that they had to wait to come from Vancouver. Yeah, so I can probably um, try to answer those questions the best I, I can. Um, we were aware of that incident. We didn't respond to that incident because obviously uh, the um, tourist information area there where Denny is is in the municipality in North Saanich. So uh, we did respond actually to a structure fire in North Saanich and supported them while they were at that incident. Um, we weren't directly called or you know requested to assist with that incident. So we didn't have any boots on the ground there. Um, I am a hazardous materials technician, was part of the CRD hazmat team, obviously prior to uh, taking on more roles here. So I can speak to it uh, to, to some extent. Um, hazmat incidents by nature are very slow and methodical. They're not, you don't look at them through the lens of we do things quickly because you want to examine what exactly you're dealing with. Again, you, you, it's not, you, you kind of, they, what we say is you you slow down before you speed up on those incidents. Again, I wasn't there, um, but it's not uncommon that the CRD hazmat team uh, deals with um, incidents that don't really cross over or, you know, kind of white powder or potentially kind of drug related uh, incidents, those are uh, under the auspices of the of the RCMP and they have their own um, response and hazardous materials technicians. And the, you know, the one uh, experience we've had with that is probably four, three and a half, four years ago, we had a uh, drug potential kind of clandestine lab at one of our hotels or concerns where we did have the hazardous materials team come um, but then we actually had to wait for the RCMP team to actually be flown over uh, to confirm. So it's it's not a great answer. Um, again, I can't, uh, you know, I wasn't there. And they do have, you know, spectrographs. They do have some testing equipment. They do have um, the ability to contact experts um, in the trailer and be able to, to speak with people saying this is the kind of powder, the consistency, et cetera, et cetera, and then speak with somebody in a, in a lab and uh, wherever it is, depending, it could be um, in Ottawa or anywhere and say, you know, what's the likelihood of this being a danger or how best do we deal with it? Um, kind of right from the site, but again, I wasn't there. So uh, again, it's, but it's not uncommon, particularly with, you know, white powder incidents in the world we live in, um, you know, nine times out of 10, it's baby powder or something that's very, very benign, but you go through the whole uh, decontamination process out of an abundance of caution. So I'm not surprised that happened. So um, probably okay. not the best answer, but that's probably the best I can provide if we weren't there. So, so. I think the way I'm understanding it is that it sounds like the CRD would uh, respond to more sort of occupational sort of type hazards and if there's any indication that it's perhaps drug related then it's more a criminal thing and would go through the RCMP. That's that's oh. correct that's okay. correct and again um, you know the CRD hazmat team probably it's a it's a large um, you know collaborative team obviously we have members on the team uh, but they only do three or four calls a year you know this isn't the the Surrey hazmat team so the, the ability and the frequency of, of our technicians and ability to kind of process and deal with these things is probably not going to be as quick as a team in Surrey or Vancouver just based on the frequency of in, in, um, incidents they attend. Okay, great. Sounds like a factor of yet another um, service decision where it would be really expensive for us to have this functionality on island compared to the frequency of use. So 
That's right. probably why they've done it the way they have. And uh, correct. Okay. okay. Yeah. And yeah. In, in relation to this incident, I, I mean, you're probably well aware this a lot of this was new for me just about the the how the issue there with the homeless people hanging out there has really seems to have exacerbated um and so they talked to i know you know that's in north Saanich jurisdiction but they these people move around a lot um it also she felt she felt uh gives a, a poor impression for people, visitors who are coming, say to Sydney or to our area that stop in there and they're greeted, there's people there and uh, aggressive dogs and things. So they talked about ha uh, having a meeting um, perhaps with the RCMP and members of the uh, municipality. So I don't know if that's, do the RCMP normally participate in this meeting as well or should I be rooting them uh, so I'm just wondering the, the, the process for them to sort of address that. I'll let Randy speak to that. Yeah, from okay. my perspective, you know, again, what Denny should be doing is she should be contacting first the, the, uh, the municipality, really, and, uh, and having a discussion about some of the homeless challenges in and around that area. And, uh, and what I think should happen then is, is uh, a meeting should be called with the uh, with the uh, with the RCMP and uh, and, and uh, there should be a, a a focused effort between the municipality and the RCMP to determine the best approach uh, to look at how to address the situation. Fundamentally, some of the, some of those aspects are going to be based upon what the municipal bylaws are in North Saanich around how to address um, you know overnight camping and overnight stays, those kinds of things, right? Municipalities have different uh, different provisions in their bylaws for that sort of thing in a, in a, in, a, in a public space. So she should uh, reach out to the municipality first. We have a, I mean, we obviously have the situation here in Sydney where we have um, a number of folks that, uh, I don't know, a large number, but a small number of folks that uh, are, um, you know, uh, homeless and uh, and uh, staying overnight in in tents in uh, predominantly uh, uh, Iroquois Park and. Uh, um, Currently, I think the situation is about three, and our bylaw enforcement officer, um, I believe now it's twice a week, um, uh, is going out with the RCMP. Uh, they do foot patrols, and they basically they call them wellness checks. But fundamentally, it's basically an opportunity for uh, bylaw and the RCMP to work together and and uh, basically ask them to uh, see how they're doing, but uh, also to. Uh, to, to move on for the day. And uh, right now they've taken a stance because of the inclement weather, because of the, the challenges of packing up their stuff and, and, and moving it on. Uh, they're, they're basically, uh, you know, taking a, a, an approach that uh, there's a bit of a hardship there to do that mm -hmm. each and every, every day. So as long as they maintain a, 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 clean, a clean site and, uh, and a very compact footprint, uh, then um, they'll uh, they'll um, they'll let the individual stay. The, the challenge is is making sure and monitoring and making sure those numbers don't grow, so that you have uh, um, you create a situation where all of a sudden now you've got an encampment and mm -hmm. uh, and you've got the challenges obviously that uh, they're seeing in Victoria, where uh, you have a large um, uh, vulnerable populate, population contingent. In a residential area, and you have all of the inherent challenges associated with that. So, um, yeah, that's a, that's a long answer. But uh, Denny should really be reaching out to the municipality and RCMP and trying to get action uh, uh, through uh, through those means. Yeah. Okay, I'll pass it along. And then the other thing that they brought up, separate issue, again, was the um, they're, they're still talking about the response times, and um, I think that had related to uh, things in the new building code and then response times from the fire department um, and how that uh, affected, uh, you know, multifamily dwellings, but also um, personal residences. So an example was given of, of someone who uh, lives in a residential, a single family dwelling, actually in my neighborhood, and they wanted to put a window on the side of their house um, and they weren't able to do that because that meant that they were, uh, there was not that appropriate response time and it was going to cost them a lot 
more money. Uh, also concern about how insurance rates across uh, the municipality um, would go up. And I guess I understand that they've brought this to, to, uh, to staff already. And basically it would require additional uh, staff on hand at the fire department is, is what I uh, understand. I think they're still interested in wanting council to consider that. So I presume the route for them would be to, to send a letter to, to, to council address uh, outlining the issues. Uh, would that be the appropriate uh, route for them to take on that? Randy, I'll let you speak to that. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know, Allison or, or yourself may want to comment on, um, on the, um, the recent changes around uh, bylaw changes that, uh, that have occurred and, uh, and um, you know, and why they've occurred, etc. I, I, I don't know if you, you, you um, want to get into to, uh, to that sort of aspect, Councillor O'Keefe, but uh, I mean, yeah. yeah, fundamentally, I guess if, if, uh, if they want to raise, raise this matter in terms of what they perceive to be the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, inherent challenges associated with the recent changes, and uh, want to propose something, yeah, the, the recourse would be to bring uh, something through correspondence through to, to council for consideration. I would fundamentally, you know, suggest then that uh, that, that would be referred to staff for a report and, uh, and we would provide um, the context, the background and the costs associated with something like that. Uh, okay. it's, it's, not, it's not gonna be an insignificant amount. And, uh, and um, yeah, there's no silver bullet on this one for sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That's all for me. Thanks. And I'll just I'll just go back and uh, by this councilor Keith. That typically, yes, the RCMP are do participate in this meeting. I think because of the the date change, uh, they had to drop out. But their regular, uh, typically, Staff Sergeant Connolly is on is on uh, part of this as active member. Just so you're aware, going going forward. Um, if there is not any, oh Brian, I saw your hand up before. Did you want to make a comment? You're muted. Yeah, Brett, and just further to uh, like cleaning up of homeless sites and things like that. Um, again, as Randy suggested, bylaw and the RCMP are doing the frontline work on that. And then once uh, a site's been abandoned or it's getting to the point where it is in a bit of disarray, then there's a request for public works to come in and help. Um, we've just reviewed our safe work procedures on that knowing that we are seeing a little bit more of a trend in uh, drug consumptions, things like that. Um, so we've got our procedures in place to deal with that. Of course, we're all aware of uh, the, the, the powders and the syringes and things like that. And uh, again, we'd be deferring to the RCMP to help us if, if it did get out of hand from, from that perspective. Uh, but we are noticing a, a little bit more, again, our problem with, with all due respect is a two out of 10 compared to some of the larger areas in the Cowichan Valley and the city of Victoria and stuff like that. Um, but I appreciate um, what we're trying to do. I, I think everybody's got to share the burden of, of homelessness. And, uh, and I think we're still at the level where we can consider ourselves to be fortunate. Yeah, I, I would agree 100%, Brian. I think the, the town has done a very good job, particularly town hall and, and, and bylaw folks in you know, even through when we had an EOC open, applying a, a pretty measured approach. You know, these these folks need um, places to be, and and obviously they're going to congregate where services, primarily you know, shelter and washrooms uh, are available. It just makes sense. Um, but again, you know, our ability to kind of go and, and check in on these folks, and I participated in these checks. You know, when we had the o EOC open, and you get to to know these folks and understand you know some of their concerns and challenges and um, you know, a lot of them are just looking for a warm place to plug in their phone and to get a shower and, and that's it. Um, but it also allows us to identify those that are likely going to uh, cause trouble. I mean, we did have, you know, fires and wooded areas and explosions and injuries and all kinds of things um, last last summer uh, during the height of this with, a you know, a few of those problems, folks. But we were able to kind of identify and understand where these issues were. Um, and kind of to minimize them. So I think that it's, it's prudent that, you know, whether it be Sydney or North Saanich, that at least you, you have a handle on what's going on and, and to kind of not turn a blind eye to it because that's when things can really kind of get out of control. So again, I think our, our folks in public works and bylaw are doing a, a good job keeping, a, keeping, you know, a measured approach on how we're dealing with this right now. 
Um, yeah, new new business. I guess one thing, and I, I before some people uh, came online, I, Councillor Keith was talking about our, our Meet Your Street initiative, and I just wanted to kind of preface that in the upcoming, we will be uh, bringing forward our proposal um, for for a project to kind of augment the, the Meet Your Street. Um, initiative and it's basically just going to more to kind of formalize how we um, develop these kind of what really are zones of we're going to call them kind of zones of resilience um, and some of this linkage uh, would be using and kind of leveraging um, our in-house IT and, and GIS mapping and again to kind of map out zones and identify areas um, of resilience of what makes sense so obviously um, things make sense where people have, you know, the meet your street is really based on a lot of social connectivity and neighborhood uh, connectivity. So neighbors looking after neighbors and those are very important things. And that's gonna be a primary driver, um, whether we have eight or nine zones um, in the town of Sydney, you know, that would be great. And then to kind of develop some, some basically some uh, actions and perhaps roles and and a few a little bit more structure so how that looks so we could um, support um, these individual kind of pods of resilience throughout the town on a, a slightly more structured basis. Um, we also want to and we would be able to look at that geographically on on a map so we'd say you know. Um, whether it's the Summergate neighborhood or harbor landing or some other areas. Um, that are obviously just their logic area, logical areas of, of where people are, are socially connected. Those are going to be others. Um, you know, whether, say, example, the Summergate neighborhood kind of includes a little bit of the Greenglade neighborhood or that's separate, we can, we'll look at that. But we also want to look at it through kind of from 30,000 feet as emergency managers and think, well, what's going to make sense for the provision of disaster water supply and other things like that. So we want to kind of look at that um, from a geographical perspective and what's going to make sense for other disasters as well. Um, and again, no matter what we invest in in the town, whether it's um, whether it's fire trucks or whatever we invest in staff, no matter the, the bang for the buck we'll get out of investing in having individuals resilient themselves uh, will always be our the best bang for our buck because if you have a, a neighborhood that uh, whether it's Summergate or one of these where if there is a seismic event and it's a connected neighborhood and they're looking after each other they know certain individuals that um, you know can't you know access foodstuffs or disaster water and they're looking after each other that's a whole group, uh, a large number of less people that we're going to have to look after when that disaster hits. And that, again, is the best place where we, 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 need, we can invest in because, the, the like I say, the bang for the buck is, is better than anything else we can do. So just wanted to kind of bring it. That will be something we'll be bringing forward in the next couple of weeks, maybe a month. We'll bring forward to council with a rough idea for a project and how we'd see that moving forward. But I just kind of wanted to highlight that's something we kind of have in, in the queue as well. Um, with that, I just Brad, ask, yes. Brad, just a quick question on it. Is, um, was there originally as part of Meet Your Street and, and, and perhaps um, if not, maybe as a part of the expanded program, an identified target in terms of how many, how many residents, how many potential community pods, et cetera, you know, would, uh, you know, would we see as being sort of um, maybe a success marker, uh, you know, for something like this? Like, is there, a, is there a defined number or do we have an idea in terms of what our target is? Well, I, I guess the, the clear answer right now is, is that's un, undefined. I, you know, we want to work with um, a consultant to identify, you know, what areas make sense geographically. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, speaking with Allison on at, at length about this, uh, this topic over the last couple of days, we know that there's going to be some neighborhoods um, just by, by design, uh, whether it's Summergate or Harbor Landing, which is relatively new, everyone moved in within the same 18 months, so they have uh, kind of this inherent connectivity, they're going to be, that's going to be easier to kind of form those bonds of kind of the meet your street versus some other neighborhoods where they're not necessarily as connected. So 
we know with all kinds of community groups, there's going to be, uh, I'm going to anticipate there's going to be between nine and 12 or 13 kind of pods of resilience in our, in our little municipality. And there's going to be about half that are going to take this and going to run with it. And it's going to be more of a, um, we're just going to have to kind of feed them a little bit and kind of help them and kind of monitor it. And then there's going to be another half a dozen that are going to need more kind of legacy investment and staff time to kind of nurture and build and bring together because their neighborhoods are not as inherently connected and are going to take a little bit more staff time to bring together. So that's how we kind of envision it. And again, as you know, from a planning perspective, that's just kind of the nature of, of, of how things go. Yeah, definitely, because I can see that, um, you know, I can see some initial interest and I can see uh, for some for some groups and uh, uh, some areas where, uh, you know, there there is uh, there is that uh, initial spark of interest. And uh, but it is something, though, that um, if it's going to be sustained for for any length of time that, uh, yeah, it's going to take a lot of uh, consistent sort of um, um you know, education and promotion and, uh, and um, work, I guess, either on behalf of the town or, or another organization or whatever, again, to sustain something like this long, long term, because uh, people come, people go, you know, some, some communities are going to have uh, real uh, leadership, uh, leadership folks that uh, are going to really push this, they move on and, uh, and um, there's a bit of a vacuum, right? So, it, it is going to take uh, some uh, consistent stuff if uh, if indeed there's it's going to be sustainable, and it, you know and that means does that mean you know consistent funding and all of that right so yeah, yeah let's be uh, clear about this we're going well outside our traditional service areas and we have to do that with our eyes wide open after the long term implications we're having a lot of consultants telling us where we should be going, but at the end of the day, um, it's going to be money. Mm -hmm. And and doing doing more than what we currently are set up to do. Sorry, if I could jump in there kind of to play devil's advocate with all due respect, um, the emergency management is something that municipalities have to do. And if this is a way to help neighborhoods be more resilient on their own and plan for emergencies, through that social connection lens, then I think there is value in that. But I think we do definitely need to be cognizant of how much staff time this starts to absorb and watch the program as it develops. We're only a few months in, there's only a few active groups. So I think it really, it's something that, yeah, we'll have to monitor as it goes forward in terms of time and capacity on staff to, to manage it. Yeah, and to echo, you know, Allison's comments, I'm, you know, the goal of this, you know, bringing the report forward would be very, you know, would be eyes wide open and we'd look very much at, um, you know, staff requirements, not just now, but obviously the legacy investment of, of staff time is, is a large, is a large factor. And we'll look at that and, and that'll be a determining factor whether it, this sees the light at the day and the other thing is, is that, you know, we do have a, it is a legislated requirement to develop and implement an emergency, you know, program. That's not something we have a choice and it's more of just um, kind of an adapting and evolving our, uh, our way of delivering that. It's, um, it's like a fire department, for example, focusing more on fire prevention versus hiring more people and, and uh, bigger, more expensive fire trucks from a response perspective. It's, it's kind of trying to um, lessen the need for that emergency response. Um, and that's kind of the angle we're going in more of a preventative basis and making people more resilient um, so that they don't need us as much in, in the event of, a, of an event. So that's where we're trying to get to. And I understand it, it's different, um, but we'll take a measured approach. And it's not like it hasn't been done before. You know, these pods of resiliency are established on Salt Spring Island. Um, they're not, uh, you know, supported by a full-time person or anything like that. So there's ways of delivering this without, you know, a massive implication of staff time or, or that, but we'll, we need to articulate that and, and see how it obviously fits in from a budgetary and staff. And, that, and that's just the, the process we're going to go through. It used to be part of the PIMO model where we had the ESS teams and the, uh, the various other uh, special tasks. Correct forces and uh, we seem to be taking more and more in-house and yeah well and again um, 
the ESS is emergency support services. So their, their spectrum of services is if your, your house burns down um, or there's a large scale disaster, you know, their, their mandate is to uh, secure, um, you know, places of refuge like the Mary Winspear Center and make sure that you're provided a voucher from the province and that you're fed and your pets looked after and you're in a hotel for three days. Um, that is their, that's their scope of work. Um, neighborhood or net program or neighborhood emergency preparedness uh -huh. and, and as well, which is one individual across the entire Santa Peninsula right now. Um, and then we kind of identified a staff member, a couple internally that help uh, that individual gives emergency preparedness talks um, to groups, obviously under these conditions, it's a lot. We're doing a few via Zoom. I think Mike's doing one later this week. Uh, but we would conduct 20, 30 a year, um, primarily the large stratas. And there'd always be a big uptick in that whenever there was a seismic event, we'd, you know, we'd run around and, and you know, there's kind of a, a, a recency bias for these type of things, but we go around and make sure that, um, you know, you understood, you know, fire and safety evacuation, but as well as emergency preparedness. And we continue to do that. This is this kind of building on, on that. So it's, you know, the, the PMO responsibility, again, it's more of an evolution and, and trying to deliver an enhanced service versus what's been done previously. Sandy? Uh, isn't it more like a block watch program? Are we not supposed to kind of piggyback on that where um, rather than getting, you know, staff involved into each individual um, group, but like providing them with information, you know, the block where where I live, we're part of a block watch program and they provide newsletters and assistance for our, our uh, block watch. Isn't it more something like that rather than getting into staff providing specific details to these people? Or uh, you were mentioning something about certain roles for people in this, in the meet and greet program? Yeah, well, exactly. Program? exactly. I think that the idea is, is to have a consultant provide and, and detail those roles for the individuals in the community. So there wouldn't be, you know, staff wouldn't be creating that um, or anything to, you know, we wouldn't be doing that. We'd be creating those kind of roles or the consultant would be creating all of oh. that. We, we wouldn't be doing it internally. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's, that's you know, we honestly don't have time for that. No. Um, and we don't have the expertise for that, to be honest. So that would be something a consultant would provide. So here's, here's what we expect, whether there's a, a, you know, the leadership positions or how often you meet or, or what have you. Um, but they're obviously, I'm just linking it to the importance of this and having um, a resilient community. Again, um, if we just going to say it's something that, that, that folks can kind of worry about on their own um, at the end when something bad happens, you know, again, the payoff is going to be if we invest in this and we're, it's, I'm really most concerned about our at-risk communities, the summer gates, the large um, buildings, primarily with elderly residents. If we can even get those pods of resilience looked after, that's a lot less at-risk folks than Mike and I have to worry about when there is a seismic event and we're worried about water and you know sewer and communications and transportation and all those things. Um, the long and the short of it is, is you're on your own for 72 hours at least, maybe longer. So, well, this is what I'm. This is what I'm talking about. People should yeah. be taking care of themselves as well. It's great that you're in a community, fortunate to be in a neighborhood where people help each other out. I mean, that's yeah. what we want. But I just, um, I wasn't sure about these groups that, uh, you know, making sure they know this, 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 and this. I think. Um, I don't know. And again, it, it'd be more of us to put a program in place via a consultant that will, the vast majority of the work would be done. And it would be more of a kind of a ideally kind of a monitoring um, check in type of thing and kind of facilitate uh, their success and kind of help them as we go. It's not going to be a large um, initiative that's going to, you know, result in someone, you know, a 0.5 position or someone's, you know, 10 hours a week or anything like that. So, so what does this mean for like, I get the meet your uh, street program for communities, um, you know, single family dwellings. So what about the stratas? Are we talking to the strata for each of these condo buildings and whatnot? 
Well, and, and again, we want to look at that. Um, we do a lot of that already. And, and you know, that's kind of being our, our existing initiative. And, you know, Mike and Donna can probably chime in. I, I bet, well, I'm going to say 60, 70 percent of the large stratas okay. uh, in Sydney, the large buildings, we've met with them. We okay. detailed that and all those things. But again, um, from a larger perspective, we may want to go and say, these three or four blocks um, right. make sense to get together and collaboratively um, are in this one kind of pot of resiliency because it, it needs to be manageable. Yeah. Uh, you know, worst case scenario, like I say, if there's a seismic event or a severe weather event, there's no power. I want to be able to put a map up on, you know, the TV in my office and say, these three or four zones are looked after, these are not. Yeah. I don't want 40 of them because I'll never be able to figure that out or, or deliver service. So that's kind of what we want to work towards. That's great. Yeah, Councillor O'Keefe. Uh, thanks. I'll just sort of add sort of my comments to what's been mentioned in terms of, um, you know, the, the block watch and the existing emergency planning. I think that there's some good things about meet the street and that's why I wanted to participate and try and support that and find out a bit more about that but I do see a fair amount of crossover between that and these other programs and and so and you know I I think all of the things you said about uh, neighborhood resiliency and for you know your area to be able to identify uh, uh, and, and support certain areas and get them more resilient um, but I guess what I'd if, if the focus is on emergency planning, um, I guess I, I'd be interested to see a bit more about how we can just supplement existing programs rather than putting funding into something that's completely new. With Meet the Street, I got the idea it was more of a, a, a social sort of connection thing, which would have, which is still good, um, and, and would, as an offshoot of that, would have some benefits in terms of community resilience, in terms of emergency planning. So I, I think it's all good, but I, I'd be interested, like I say, rather than investing into a third thing, look for ways that we can pull the existing programs uh, together under one umbrella at one, and perhaps adding in some of the things you talked about. So just for your consideration, thanks. You, you bet, Donna? I think that's a good way to put it is Meet Your Street really is an umbrella. So Meet Your Street is promoting block watch, neighborhood emergency preparedness. It's meant to be more the town's way of overseeing the success of those programs because currently we're not involved in block watch. We don't really have numbers on neighborhood emergency preparedness and so forth. So this is our way of, like Brett explained, um, we can kind of keep tabs on what neighborhoods are doing and where our concerns still lie. So I think if you look at it from that sense, it's really benefiting the town. You're right, these programs are in place and they're doing a wonderful job and it's just sort of our way of promoting them and being involved in them, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I guess what I would, I, I'd wonder is, um, so you don't have those, those figures and amounts from PMO or from Blockwatch, but I mean, they're in our community. I, I'd be curious to, to investigate that further about how, how we could have a closer relationship and how you could have access to that information and work sort of more collaboratively if that's a feasible or not. Go on. Yeah, um, so PMO, of course, we do have we do have access to that. It's just now we're a little bit more involved. Blockwatch, I was quite surprised when we were developing Meet Your Street and our initial conversations with the RCMP. It's not centralized out of our actual local station. It's a it's a province program or provincial program, sorry. So they were unable to provide us anything as far as um, where Blockwatch exists in our community. So this is our way of kind of getting access to that information, if that makes sense. It's very much a, um, like a closed off program as far as us being involved. So this gave us an opportunity to kind of weasel our way in. I agree, it would be great to be more involved with Blockwatch and have those statistics, know where they are in our community, but unfortunately the RCMP can't share that information, which I can completely understand, but this is our way of sort of gaining access to it. 
Excellent. Um, any other new business slash round table? We'll kind of, anything else? We can beat all this. To... So lots of good things here. That's a good first uh, meeting for the year. I look forward to transitioning to um, kind of away from COVID one day and kind of getting back onto kind of our a regular list of items that were identified pre-COVID, but those have all kind of been usurped, obviously, as a result of what's going on. Mr. Humble. Yeah, just uh, just for um, just for um, um, Castro Keith's benefit. So, typically, um, Terry, this uh, this committee, this group would meet uh, just quarterly, uh, uh, four times a year. But uh, the decision was. Um, um, a while back that uh, that uh, we would benefit from during COVID of having uh, at least monthly meetings for the uh, for the uh, emergency planning committee uh, meetings. So that's why we're doing this monthly, but typically it would just be a quarterly meeting. Thanks, Randy. That's a, that's a great point. Um, if there is nothing else, I will just, uh, so someone can throw up a virtual hand for um, um, our next meeting will be February 17th and uh, a motion to adjourn. Mr. Harmon seconded, everyone's in favor. I thank you, uh, I thank you all for attending and uh, we'll see you all soon or if not, February 17th. Thanks again.